Well, welcome to the Cube Pod episode 19. We're almost at 20, Dave. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, for our uh, Cube Pod, where we break down what we're looking at every week, uh, the stories hitting the internet, enterprise technology, emerging tech, what's going on in the tech industry from an enterprise perspective. Um, it's cube season. Of course, we're on the road all the time, going to events, extracting the signal from the noise. Of course, SiliconAngle.com is where all the stories are hitting. The growth of SiliconAngle has been great, and the, the cube brand is growing, Dave. It's been, been an amazing year that events are coming back, plus our digital business is booming with our content. Events are back, and the, and the market's changing radically. Um, huge news this week. I mean, just goes on and on. The whole Elon Musk is in the news as Facebook comes out uh, with a competitor, Meta, I should say, comes out with a competitor uh, it's called Threads, which as of right now has 70 million downloads, you know, 4 million downloads in the first two hours. I got it in the first five minutes. Um, Elon Musk is basically, it's an anti-Elon pledge, uh, but it's also a Facebook kind of head fake with Instagram. We're going to go unpack that heavily. Um, a lot of news there. Um, Twitter's problems completely multiply. I have a solution. I'm not even going to talk about what Twitter could do. Frankly, you know, I've been saying it for years. I'm not going to go there, but they have really one move. Are they going to be killed by Facebook? And in other news, just in is that the, the cage match between the physical altercation, there are odds already on on uh, Vegas around Elon Musk and and uh, Zuckerberg actually getting into an actual physical match. That was the original thing. I think that was just a lead into this um, sidecar carnival show of a Twitter clone by Facebook to take on Twitter as Twitter is so weak, their, their problems multiply. And of course, more cloud computing stories. Amazon PR is really getting killed against uh, Microsoft. That's a big story I've been talking a lot about lately. Um, although I post the Matt Garman story, that's getting a lot of traction. Um, and venture capital is still booming in AI, but yet it's down in all of the sectors. You're seeing signs of, of, of companies looking at fume dates now. People talking about companies falling out of the sky. So a lot of a lot of stuff going on there. And of course, AI nonsense is continuing to hype up. Andy Jassy was on CNBC, um, and a lot of action happening uh, in cloud. So again, just massive stuff. Chat GPT 4.0 is now available for everybody. They're falling from grace as traffic is dipping. So Chat GPT is down. Facebook, of all the things that they could do to save the world and make the world a better place, they're launching a Twitter clone. Like, do we really need, does the world really need another Twitter clone? I mean, really? Come on. And this whole anti-Musk uh, thing is ridiculous. Twitter not standing, they have a lot of fuck-ups. But really, Zuckerberg, that's the best you're going to do? Copy Twitter? Of all the things that they could do, I mean, I'll say that for my rant section, Dave, but Facebook has absolutely got all the guns. They have too many knobs to turn. If they want to take down Twitter, it's going to be a matter of time. They got the Instagram social graph. They avoided the cold start problem that everyone's been talking about. Every app knows it's hard. Jack Dorsey's Blue Sky just has 300,000 downloads since June 30th. Wow, what a big number. Two days, three days in, Zuckerberg's got 70 million downloads, Dave. 70 million downloads. It took ChatGPT two months to get 100 million users. Now, granted, one's an app download, one's a website. So the top story in tech is clearly threads. It's impacting our world as people move and try to cross post between Twitter and uh, threads. Again, threads is Instagram. I mean, I proved that this morning. The uh, the head of Instagram was on the record. It's just Instagram with the social graph, all your interests, tweaking your feed, making you see what you want to see. And now I'm seeing that uh, Adam Masseri says, threads will not encourage politics and hard news as such content brings scrutiny. That means all the news sites are going to get fucked. Trust me on this one. It's going to happen. Welcome to, hey, pod, John. Welcome to pod 19, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, certainly Meta made it easy to sign up for threads. You just, anybody you follow on Instagram and follows you and made it really super easy. But it, I think you're right. It's just basically Instagram with a feed. I don't know. I mean, I, you see, you and I maybe use Instagram differently. I don't use, I, I use Instagram a lot, mostly for consuming content. I post every now and then, but I don't post a lot of business stuff, which is different on a Twitter. I do a lot of, sort of covering events and giving my thoughts and opinions. I don't know, that's just maybe force a habit. Um, and Threads is fine, it's good. I mean, wow, all the downloads, maybe that's sort of, you know, the newness of it, the novelty of it. 
Um, I think it's okay, but it's basically Instagram as well. So I, I like Instagram better than Threads so far. I still like Twitter. I'd be interested to see here how you think, you know, Twitter is going to get killed or maybe could be saved. But I still like Twitter. I get good news from Twitter. I think I, I think Twi I, I'm, Twitter. I think I think Twitter is too big to die personally. But if it's going to die, it's going to die because of the attacks from the right uh, left wing party because everyone's accusing Twitter of being parlor, turning into a right wing, which is not true. Now, the right wing is dominating Twitter right now because you see things like the all-in pod, as we know. By the way, they're not all those guys on the all-in pod, Dave, are not on threads yet. It's interesting. You know, Jason Calcanis was was uh, quoted in the text message they, that was discovered during the lawsuit. Private text message. Like, I give you my sword. They don't like, I'll fight with you to the death. Is it? Uh, and, and so they're not on. Those guys are all in and all the all in podcast is not on threads because they're it, anti anti. They're on Elon side. Is it? <laughs> that's lame. So is it true that you can't delete your threads account without deleting your Instagram account? That is a true statement. OK, it's, so threads. So, threads is just Instagram back okay. end with the front so, end uh, user. Right, interface. Right. So this is so they took just Facebook. says it all. It just says it all. So. Zuckerberg's going to save us from Twitter. I guess is this year. This is your rant. Is kind of my rant too. It's like really we're going to trust this guy with our privacy. I mean, their, their track record, Meta's track record on privacy and governance. I mean, just look at the corporate structure. It's abysmal. And so, yeah. but I mean, I love Facebook. I mean, as as a company, I mean, the platform and and amazing two billion plus users. You love the you love what the a, company. What oh my great, god! What you're one of the, you're business. one of the we're the no, one of minorities. No, not, in terms of the business model, I love it. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, it's just, I would people would kill for that business model. I mean, the the profitability. People of that have company, people the, have been people have the, been killed. The cash flow of that company. I mean, it's people incredible. Have been, but it, people have been killed of, because of their well, their second, lack of just, policies. But but. From a business, from a cash making standpoint, yeah, it is a money a, machine. It's a, it's a it's, phenomenal business, is what I'm trying to say. Google okay? Ad, Google You're AdWords right. is a phenomenal business model. Targeting okay, on a, Facebook a is a topic, phenomenal let business just, model. Let me, just, let, me just, let me just get my thought out. You, get, yeah. <laughs> you maybe should do this podcast solo, John. You could probably pull it off. You don't like those, you know, those like the, yeah. the sports talk radio guys who go solo. I'm always just so impressed with guys that could just. I keep it interesting for such a long period of time. And you have that skill. Us. It's amazing. But anyway, what I was saying is that the corporate governance of Facebook is a joke, right? I mean, you know, Zuckerberg is going to be in control in per per perpetuity, right? It's a controlled company. So we're going to trust this guy to save us from Twitter. I mean, uh, really, to your point, you really can't do anything better than that. And then the whole cage match thing, I, was, I think Zuckerberg would kick Elon's ass i mean right i mean he's in good shape he's, he's been working in good out. shape I mean, <laughs> musk, he's, musk he's got the MMA. Mm -hmm. those guys are crazy M musk I mean, has the dad bod and zuckerberg's getting <laughs> yoked as they say you know so, <laughs> he's so. fleshy white <laughs> gonna get his ass kicked you're right <laughs> zuckerberg would look, kill at, him. look at facebook is a, he's evil genius okay just I'll, I'll quote your genius uh my point because they are an amazing business model cheryl sandberg uh, built an amazing engine based on Zuckerberg's core invention, which is, um, you know, copied PHP code from the other guy and they're copying Twitter now, but I don't want to go that and I'll say that for my rant section, but their business model is just phenomenally strong. You can target and for the benefits of the advertisers that offers the same exact benefits for the adversaries and facebook.com, which is no longer the name of the company is now called meta is old hat okay and instagram by the way which became the new facebook all the younger kids are on instagram people love instagram and now they introduce threads and my research quick spot research that i've done the past three days of being on the app and and talking to folks from all age spectrums is that the general consensus is anyone under the age of 30 is like this is weak what this is turning into is the facebook generation that now has kids right so if you're in college in 2007, you're now having kids. You're in your 30s, like Zuckerberg. And guess what? Threads is like a new nightclub. That's for the, the middle-aged, growing social media originals. We're relics because we were pre-social media, okay, or kind of early on. So, but think about it. Zuckerberg's in his 30s, and that whole crew 
This is their site. This is like a new nightclub. So this is their Twitter moment. And and so, you know, I think it's not going to, I think, I, I'm not sure it'll have sustainability. And if it is, it's at the expense of Instagram. So, you know, I was talking about this on, on, on threads, actually, with uh, folks like Howard Linson, who started stock twits and others, is that one of the problems that Twitter, that they have in this battle to take over the Twitter territory is that Zuckerberg's cannibalizing Instagram. So I'd be curious to see what the daily active uniques are for Twitter, Instagram, and threads the past three days. I would bet that the, that the, 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 it would drop significantly on the Instagram side because remember, you're pulling your graph over from Instagram. So Instagram traffic is going to drop. I've already felt that on my user experience that, you know, I look at the stories and that's it. I pretty much ignore most of the feed on Instagram now that I'm on threads because threads is engaging. They did a good job on the onboarding, as you pointed out, and it's their algorithm is highly tweaked on what you're doing on Instagram. So they have pre-existing information about what you know. So, and what they're doing I, is they're tweaking threads with all these people coming in and serving you into the feed things that they know you like out of the gate. That's a winning hand. That's a pre-existing condition of their scale monopoly. That's a, that is, and, and by the way, they hired editors too to edit the feed. So now we've come into the whole: Are they a platform, Dave, or are they a publisher? Well, I'm telling you, this is going to be a fun conversation. I think we're going to be talking about threads on the podcast a lot. I can only uh, speak to my own experience. I haven't done you know a lot of research as you have, but I would agree with you. I, I have spent more time on threads. I, I'm not sure it's going to consume a lot of my time, but it's the novelty that is attracted to me. And I see a lot of folks on there. I see you on there. You're pretty active. I see Stu. I see Michael Dell and you know some other folks that we know. Um, but it has taken away from my Instagram time. It has not affected my Twitter time. I still go into Twitter, I check what's happening, check out my DMs, maybe do a few posts. I was very active um, during the Snowflake Summit on uh, on Twitter. Usually when you and I are at events, like you know, any analyst, we're, at, we're pretty active and you get a bunch of new followers and you're laying down your, your thoughts, blah, blah, blah. Pretty inactive this week other than consuming, but it definitely, took away from my Instagram. And I'll say this, I enjoy the Instagram experience better because I use it for different things. To me, threads, Twitter, you know, kind of similar. It was, um, it was I, kind of, it was kind of fun, David. Your, what was your first tweet of threads that you posted? Um, I, I commented on the cleanliness of the, the look and feel. I thought they re, did a really good job from a tech standpoint. I thought it was, was well done. Uh, and, and, and I, then I read that, you know, it's, it's bolted uh, on to Instagram. I can't delete my account. Not that I want to delete my account, but I just think that's typical, yeah. you know, uh, that, that, that you got to delete your Instagram account. I wouldn't want to delete my Instagram account. I like my Instagram. Um, but I just, I, I think, I, I think I'm going to, I'm, I'm kind of in wait and see mode. I'll float a few, you know, comments and respond maybe more to other people's stuff. But I, but Twitter's still my primary for my opinions and my thoughts uh, and, and LinkedIn yeah. too. And on Instagram, I, I just use it for a different experience. You're active on Facebook. I mean, your Facebook is awesome. I, I've, been, I, I've been cutting back on Facebook. It's becoming a lot of people. A lot of people are tapping out in my friend group. So Facebook's becoming the old fogies ground. Really, yeah, I know. Not, well, it's not well, really kind of happening. And and Instagram's becoming like the millennials still having fun, and the Z's or the Z's are on TikTok. But again, so th Threads is like it's like a high school. Re you know what Threads is? It reminds me of the first day at middle school. Hey, everybody. Good to see you again. I saw people I haven't seen in years. Hey, what's going on? It's like, you got hey, new clothes. Hey, you got your, look, you this, got your new fall clothes on. Look at me. Yeah. I've been doing great. New How are you kicks, doing? New How's sneakers. It, it, it totally yeah. is back to school. I mean, it's, absolutely back to school. Everyone's like, have a good time. Snarky comments. It's like a nightclub, Dave. It's like, it's like, it's a, it's a spectacle of a nightclub that everyone knows is gonna is good and everyone's in there. And so now that they hit the 70 million million mark, it's going to get popular because of the number. And again, this is a huge technical discussion as well in the enterprise with cloud. When you have cloud scale, okay, and you have now generative AI coming around the corner, 
This is essentially another act in the Facebook playbook that hasn't changed anything. The users of the product, they have all the data on you. They have some sort of promise out there. This activity hub is going to be a decentralized protocol to allow you to take your data anywhere. That is complete horse shit. Okay, it's never going to happen. Facebook always has kind of a promise. It's going to be open. We're going to make you choose. They've never delivered on any of those promises ever, not once. And this is going to be a real problem for our business and the news and, and free content that has sites, bloggers, um, podcasters. This is going to suck a lot of energy out of those franchises. And they're already downgrading news and politics, which is where the conversations are. So uh, I don't not I do not see Twitter dying if they if they make those moves, but they got a lot of market power. They have a lot of knobs to turn to juice up threads to be very viable against Twitter. Uh, and there's already hate against Elon. So that's almost half the people. Well to turn Elon into a right wing, you know, uh symbol, which is guaranteed to give them half the market. And if they fork the market, then we're double posting, basically. Obvi obviously YouTube Meta have cracked the business model code on uh, UGC, but nobody's cracked the user code. And I think, I think several YouTube years has. ago, I think YouTube has. Uh, well, yes and no. Yeah, here's what I mean. Um, I, I, several years ago, we, I think you and some others on the team came up with the notion of value graph, where the user actually we is in a position that. to monetize his or her data. And that data actually is portable and you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. You own your own data. And that's where I think, you know, the promise of, of blockchain and some of the other, and even crypto came in where you could use gamification, create a horizontal layer and actually allow people to control their own data destiny. And the hard part obviously is getting a business model out of that, but I guess Reddit is the closest to that uh, as we saw recently. Um, so so I think actually Reddit you, you, actually you has Reddit, cracked the code there. Well, they just, just shut down all those subreddits and shut down the API. How could you well, they had cracked yeah. it and then they just screwed their user you know, generated base. They just, so they fucked they just, that up. No, they and just so, shut but, down the API and then resolved it. So what they well, did is saying, they, they, cracked, it. they cracked the code to fuck over the users, you mean? Well, they had it. They had it and they could have not screwed it, but they screwed the pooch. So, so I'm just saying that was an example of I think, uh, an organization that, that had successful. it right, but then screwed it. Yeah. So, and I think it, I think greed is the reason why. So there's, okay. there's so still I, a I need. So for, you're saying they the ones, you're saying they had it right, but blew it. Yes. And then they fucked okay. it up. And okay. so, so, but, but that model, I think, I thought was the right one until they, you know, get, well, let, hold on. Let's, let's take let's take a break here because this is a good, this is good conversation. So let's talk about who's cracked the user code, meaning user experience utility. I think YouTube is definitely still better than Threads or anything else out there. I think Twitter certainly cracked the code from day one and continues the best product. I'm with you on Twitter. I love Twitter better than I'm, I'm a loyal Twitter. I built Twitter, as they say, as like all, with all the other millions of people. People actually built Twitter. Facebook was built by Zuckerberg and they game it and it's all throttled. There's no real, the users aren't building the, the product like they did with Twitter. The early days of Twitter, when we were going through that, you remember the fail whale and there's a community. It was like a community. There is zero community with threads. It's essentially Zuckerberg's kingdom that's amassed a lot of users that they have all these levers to turn to gamify the crowd. And that's a fact. That's well documented. Uh, and we talk about that all the time. YouTube is good. YouTube's got videos, they do it great, they stay true to their knitting, pun intended. Um, and they're good at what they do. And they're on now getting over the top on cable. So relative to video and how creators are winning, I think YouTube's great. They got you can snip it on top of it from a video standpoint. From a crypto decentralized own your data, then I don't think they even have any plans. No, I think, but, I don't, but I don't think anyone's cracked the code on that. But, in fact, but to your point, to your point, you, you know, YouTube creators can make some some good bank. I, I, you know, maybe Wikipedia is the closest, but it's kind of elitist. Uh, but maybe Jimmy Wales should. So should, I think should, so. Should so come out and solve this problem. Wikipedia, it's so old. Uh, it's like it's like it's like the time machine, you know, but still keeps on ticking. I think Discord. I mean, Wikipedia is like the web. It, it nailed the code and it doesn't really change at all. It's not even a product anymore. It's like a, it's like a standard. It's more of a standard, less of a user thing. It's like saying the web cracked the code. 
but like let's talk about real software environments. Discord, I think they got it. I think yeah, Instagram yeah. had it. Um, and Instagram beat Snapchat, by the way. How about how do you feel about uh, you know they copied Snapchat now they're going to go to Threads and so so I think Instagram had it and still has it. And we'll see how Threads impacts that. I think Threads is going to cannibalize the crap out of Instagram. It's going to just be Instagram as one thing. Um, Discord, YouTube are my favorites right now. I think blogging might come back, and I think Substacks, the the subscription newsletters, are actually going to benefit from this new threading kind of environment. Why do you think that? Because like already on threads, it's a shitty content market. It's all it is, is high school hallway, right? It's like, you know, um, there's nothing of substance on there. Um, Cause they, well, and not yet, but it's, they're gaming it for like back to school kind of vibe. And so what that allows journalists like Taylor Lorenz, who's a great journalist, um, allows her to flex her story and go direct to her audience and be a personality and get to do all the attention getting snarkiness and commentary without um, doing long form posts. So as a lead gen mechanism, if I'm a, if I'm a writer, I'll get on these threads to promote my brand, to get subscribers to subscribe to my paid newsletter. If you don't have a thread like this, we have a big watering hole or a public square like Twitter, Twitter you got to really go direct and you know how expensive it is to kind of market product on the internet relative to the volume. So the ROI on threads and Twitter when you have large numbers like that is high. And Facebook knows this. That's why if you look at all the rankings going up right now on threads on its third day, they're promoting the personalities. And this, in fact, is like a sub complaint going on from the rising journalists of the, in their, that are in their late 20s and 30s. Include me on the list. You know, New York Times writers getting special treatment, you know, that kind of thing going on. So so this total gamification on threads, uh, it's it's a case study of manipulation. It's a case study of, of how to crack the cold start problem that every app has um, that can't get off the ground and need to get that flywheel. It's an example of scale. It's an example of monopoly in action. It's Facebook literally getting 70 million downloads for a new app. So what do you make of this lawsuit that Twitter's threatening, right? So you saw that, right? Twitter's yeah, I mean, that's that's total BS. I mean, he laid up all his people. He laid up all his people. I mean, come on. Oh, exactly. That's, I mean, he, that's just, that's this just, is, is, don't you think that's like, like total, totally duplicitous? He fires everybody and then, okay, so let's say Zuck picks up a few and builds a copycat. What's, I, I, why, is that illegal? No, it, the, the lawsuit is one thing. Elon's strategy of the lawsuit is very simple and clear and one purpose only, to sue Facebook, to slow them down because he likes to play in court. Now, he doesn't- So it's a, a Trump move. It's a Trump-like move. A, it's, it's a, tr it's a yeah, yeah. And, that, and then by the way, his entire Trump moves that he's been trolling with since he started with Twitter, whoever's it, whoever advised him on that is totally backfiring on him right now. His only hope right now is, is Elon's only hope right now is to sue them, get him in court, which by the way, Meta, Facebook has a huge war chest. And like you said, their business model is massively profitable. Their ad spend is like way up here. And Twitter's like down on the, the seller, like on the rounding error compared to Facebook's numbers. So it could help. It could help actually just it's, attract even more users. Can attract more users to threads and Facebook will win with dollars. So, you know, it'll stay in court and, and the Twitter will eventually lose on the court. But Elon's only move is to stall with the court, court move and then just get a better product. So, the so-called Elon genius, product genius. Let's see what he's got. It's gonna be very interesting to see Elon step up to this challenge. Does he fold like a cheap chair? Or does he step up and build a product that actually is good? Their product, he's made so many snafus, the rate limiting, he killed the API, um, he killed our product. We had crowdchat.net. Anyone who knows Cube knows crowdchat.net is dead because of Elon's mishandling of the API and the entire developer community brings in a new CEO from, from Madison Avenue. She's going to inherit negative earnings, if you will, on ad sales and now a competition with an ad juggernaut like Facebook. <laughs> and uh, a, a social graph that's already tuned to manipulating people's preferences and feeding them what they want. Dude, it's over if this doesn't get, if they don't no. dig in, if they don't dig in Instagram, <laughs> Instagram and AKA threads will absolutely crush them. Snapchat got killed by Instagram reels. Everyone knows that, but Snapchat was good. They're a good management team. They survived it because they're good and smart.
So, yeah, so, but they still, the numbers are down on Snapchat. You ask anyone that was a Snapchat user, if they're using Snapchat today, that probably is the answers. I'd say 50% no. No, Snap had it for a little while. It was the hot thing among young people and then they just lost it. Um, but, you know, people are bringing out their their A game for threads, right? Because it's new. Mike, Michael Dell, you probably saw it, uh, just put out a picture of a server. What do you call it? Threaded out a picture of a server saying- Multiple this threads. Ser this server has <laughs> multiple threads. You know, threads uh, that basically allow you to do things in parallel sequences on yeah. the server. GPU is yeah. pretty funny. It's a good developer um, joke. So it's a good developer joke. But yeah, so people are getting creative because it's new. But I, but I have to say, there's there's a lot of action on threads. You know, I mean, it's, it's the engagement is high. The the engagement is there. The you know, Kara Swisher's on there. Um, you know, you're seeing a lot of celebrities, a lot of the politicians are jumping right in. So. People are recycling their favorite hits from Twitter. I'm looking at a bunch of people like, oh, I've seen that tweet before. They go into their top tweets that they've done that are evergreen and recycling them back into threads. Back, Like you so, said, it's back to school, new jeans and new look. It's, it's the 80s, no more no more 70s. Let's go and fashion change. You know, so this is a, interesting. So Alex Stamos uh, uh, tweeted out or threaded out, I have 300 times the follower count on Twitter, but I'm getting already much more engagement here it's amazing how hard it is to have your tweet seen now without paying for a fake check mark which by the way is not true I mean, yeah. you know. no, howard Lindzen said the same thing i posted his reposted his blog because he nailed it you know he he like us were early day twitter users and he actually was just before us when we invested in all the fire hose work we did um on silicon angle in the cube um he built stock twits and he was a great innovator, great entrepreneur, Howard Linson. And and uh, I've known him for years, not, not really good friends with him, but I know him in, in around conferences and stuff and kind of journey him in together. He built a killer app and he was part of the early crowd of this is a great community and the data was used for developers. And then it just went to hell in the handbasket um, when they started to try to monetize things and they screwed over their developers. And so he talks about that and he's saying the same exact thing. I'll do threads because I get more engagement and I'm not a big fan of Elon and Twitter's business model, how they screwed everything, but he's still, still not happy. He thinks it's a backward step. Um, and so to me, this is just Twitter rebooted as like a new nightclub and it's the new fashion. It's like, you know, it's like you wake up one day and you were in the seventies, you know, and uh, then it's like the eighties punk rock. You go to disco to punk, you know, that's that's the way I see it. So what else is going on? I've been playing around with the Cube AI. It's getting better and better every week, John. I can't yeah, wait to release this thing. What are we doing here? We're gonna we gonna open it up to like a private beta. Yeah, and it's good enough, I think. I'm letting it's... people in right now on the uh, the CubeAI.com. Check it out. Um, <laughs> there's a company out there that's calling themselves the Cube AI. And it's a development to Cube Dev. It's a funded company by John Sadoka and Decibel and some other venture guys. A um, little bit of confusing conflict, but we'll, we'll get through that. Um, but we're letting people in. It's a, it's a wait, got a wait list coming in, and we got people who are active on there. I see that right now, um, playing around, typing in queries. But I think most of the people are, are typing in, you know, what's the best interview of Kubernetes? Um, and they're using, we're using that corpus of data. And, and, you know, this is another thread, by the way, I still have to go back to threads, but <laughs> thread was like, give me a better LLM and a data and a data company over this nonsense. Um, kind of talking about this is really not a tech web revolution as everyone's hyped up about. It. It's just, it's basically Facebook refactoring their install base. And so I, I think a lot of people who are working hard on some of these new technologies, Dave, like AI are like, not pissed off at this hype machine with threads, but more of really, this is what people are getting excited about. Another Twitter. So the AI side is great. I mean, we're using it. Um, I posted um, last week, I posted Matt Garman and uh, Fitzy was commenting and Charles Fitzgerald coming about the hype of PR from Amazon. Really critical as I have been on uh, Amazon's PR. Um, they're just doing all the wrong things, you know, with PR. I mean, they're, they're burning bridges in the marketplace and they're, telling the wrong story. They, they, it's a hard story to tell and they're telling it wrong. They're telling it from a defensive perspective. Um, and that's why I posted the full transcript of my Matt, Matt Garman interview because he was really good. He nailed it. And he basically was telling the Amazon story. 
uh, every company like ours and others will have AI. So I think that's kind of the reality. And coming off the Databricks event, it's very clear that you're going to start to see platforms emerge to support more large language models and foundation models for AI. So I think the AI story is much bigger than the thread story and the Elon Musk versus Zuckerberg story, which is dominating the press and has everyone kind of in this, this uh, hallucinogen mode right now. So um, this week's breaking analysis, we unpacked the Databricks conference, which I was not at, you were at. Uh, so I spent the you know, last several days just watching the keynotes. I got to say, I was very impressed. Unlike most conferences today, which have compressed the keynotes, Ali Goetze's keynote, day one keynote, I think he, I think he broke Andy Jassy's record, John. It was almost three hours, that keynote. And it was really good. I think yeah. there was so much information in there that was compelling. I really liked the way he got all, you got Matei involved. Your interview with Matei was great, by the way. I used one of the clips from there um, on their, their open strategy. And but he brought out co-founders. He brought out Naveen Rao from uh, uh, Mosaic ML, who gave a really strong presentation. The, the the fireside chat with JPMC went way longer than. Of course, I, we profiled them a couple of years ago on breaking analysis with their data mesh strategy that they're doing on AWS. It was interesting to see how that's evolved. We, to hear the guy from JPMC saying we're doing data products. I remember when they first did that, we reported on it and yeah. researched it. Um, I thought the, you know, JetBlue one was not that great. Rivian was okay, uh, but- I but love the, the Rivian, vi the video they did with the Rivian. The video was, was awesome. Was great. It was awesome going up the, <laughs> the like, off-road. I want to buy one of those things. So but I got to so say that, that, that the themes were good. Um, they had a lot of hits. It really resonated with me. You know, and I'm, you know me, I'm like a Snowflake fanboy. I, I thought the keynotes at, uh, at Databricks and the content was, was stronger, it was more in depth, it was more featured from the technology side of the house, the founders. I didn't think Snowflake gave the, the founder enough time. T Thierry, one of the other founders typically doesn't talk much, but but Benoit Dajaville does. And I think they shortchanged him. I would have liked to hear more from him. You know, Christian Kleinerman is the product guy. He went deep, which was good. Mm -hmm. But I thought that I gotta say, I, I was impressed. You said there were 12,000 people there. Um, and I think, you know what? The more I think about it, these guys, they're not on the collision course that I had thought. I think the market's huge. I actually think not, neither has a are you talking? Are you talking they, they as in Databricks or Snowflake? Databricks and Snowflake. Um, I don't think they're on the uh, collision course as I thought. I think they're obviously going after the same opportunity. I saw your interview with Sanjeev Mohan, who said, hey, ultimately the business outcome requirements are the same, the customer requirements, and they're taking different paths to get there. But I think, you know, I think Snowflake is probably three or four or five years ahead in data management. And I think that 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 uh, Databricks is three or four or five years ahead in MLAI. Obviously LLMs sort of changed that, but but the, the there's so much market there. And I think they're both going to do really, really well. It's it's hard for me to say that that anyone is going to you know, take the mantle, but like back in the day of Oracle and Sybase and Informix and IBM with the database wars, at the time you didn't really know who was going to win, but you knew somebody was going to win. Here it's like, you got the big three cloud providers, you got Snowflake, you got Databricks, you got a bunch of other, you know, smaller players. There's a big market, you know, for four or five companies, I think, to thrive. Yeah, and I, I think, I think it's a platform of platforms. I think that was the, my takeaway from the past weeks on the cube is um, a couple things. One is the rise of the data developer. The idea of a data modern stack is emerging. We're hearing that all the time uh, from folks, investors. You got the infrastructure, you got the middleware, you got the application, that kind of construct is coming around super cloud, super computing, super infrastructure. And then you get the super cloud layer and then you have super apps. I think the generative, generative AI trend um, is going to emerge very quickly at the 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 spectrums of the stack, the lower end and the top end. I think what you're going to see is you're going to see two areas of innovation coming from from these companies that are going to enable this. By the way, Databricks and Snowflake are just one of a few. You got at scale vast data, which is emerging out as a data platform from some scuttlebutt I'm hearing in the industry um, and others. MongoDB is a platform now, and you heard about some of their multi cloud capabilities, VMware, cross cloud, Cisco. You're going to see a platform collision. But it's all going to revolve around the super cloud narrative that we have. 
And that is at the bottom of the stack, that the physical layer from silicon, Andy Jassy talked about it just yesterday uh, on, on, on camera around uh, the chip advantage around GPUs and inf inferenza uh, for inference and training, physical layer innovation, and then top of the stack in the app. The big gap is going to emerge in the middle. So I think you're going to see a squeezing of a of, of, of force for gen of AI from both ends of the spectrum. And the middle layer is going to be the super, what I call the super loud layer. And that's going to be a collection of platforms. And it's going to be like a, like a connective tissue model where it's going to be not static. It's going to be dynamic. And right now, all the use cases for generative AI are, you know, stuff that can be automated. You see in that at the physical layer, like DevOps, scripts, stuff that's, that's repeated. That's automation, easy place. Software co-pilots, you see that all the time, help me code. I think you're going to see more of that. Um, that's at the coding level. Um, and then network policies, you're going to see you know, that infrastructure get quickly adopted with generative AI. And the apps are obvious. What we're doing is an example. Using data as a part of feeding into a user experience that's different and better. That's happening now. Okay, I was talking with Cisco yesterday, Jatu Patel who came on for SuperCloud Keynote. They already have an automated like SOC capability assistance for like um, securities operating centers. They got data from uh, all the routers. They can go in and look at telemetry data in real time and predict and do all kinds of cool inferencing. So you're going to see that immediately now. The area that's going to be up for grabs is where Databricks and Snowflake are, as you pointed out, at scale, vast data, MongoDB, that's going to be where the action with the cloud comes in. Amazon's going to fight tooth and nail for that. AWS is, I mean, Microsoft's going to fight tooth and nail. And Google's a dark horse. And then ultimately, the benefit from all this, Oracle could come out a winner, Dave, because they got the whole Oracle on Oracle compute engineered systems. They could be a compute farm for, for GPUs. So I think that generative AI could change the landscape in the cloud world better than we've ever seen before. We've, you know us, we've always been like Amazon's miles ahead of Microsoft. That's gaps closed. Oracle, a fourth place at best. Google, nipping at the heels, way behind. The order's changing. You know, the course has changed. The horses are changing. Uh, it's quite an amazing time, Dave. I got to say, this is the most compelling time I've ever seen. And if those horses change positions, just think about the ramifications to the end user opportunity. And, well, the, and the ecosystem. It's just mind-blowingly, it's, it's a mind-blowing experience because it's like the whole ecosystem's changed. Economics, the wealth, who gets what cash, white space for startups. It's going to be amazing. So <laughs> there's like 15 things there that I could comment on, but I'll pick out a couple. Yeah. Um, you reminded me of something. So this week, um, I think it was this week, some there was some leaked data from the Activision Azure um, hearing. And supposedly Azure's business is not nearly as big as everybody thought, including myself, but I'm skeptical. So I was chatting with Sarbjeet Johal about this on Twitter and they've taken away, they've redacted that sort of leaked doc. So you can't really find the exact context, but supposedly uh, they gave a number as to the the trailing twelve months from last summer to the, to the to the twelve before, and it was it was around I want to say twelve to fifteen billion dollars smaller than most estimates. So they had it in kind of the I don't know, mid to high twenties, and I was in the sort of mid thirties in that twelve month period. It was like summer to summer, uh, so significantly smaller. Um, and a smaller share. So they cited Gartner, they cited Statistica, which, you know, I don't know what the source was on Statistica. You got to double click and get it, but Sarbjeet didn't, didn't disclose that. And I don't, I don't have a subscription anymore. Um, but, but the point is that Microsoft in its documents released that data. Now I'm still skeptical. I want to see the original wording of this. Number one, number two is Microsoft's trying to paint the picture that it's not the monopoly and it's never divulged those numbers. So it could basically say whatever it wanted to. It could take its whole intelligent cloud business and say, okay, this much is IS and PaaS and there's so much fluff in there. 
But nonetheless, you know, it, there is some evidence that people are overestimating Microsoft's you know, presence in cloud. So that's one thing I wanted to talk about. You mentioned- <laughs> We knew that all along actually, but <laughs> we've been saying that all along. Well, it's hard to say because they give guidance on growth that they don't give guidance on the actual starting point of the numbers. So you had to guess as to what the numbers were. You know, I use survey data and talk to people. And, and I, I do have, actually I have data points that suggest that they're larger than that leaked doc suggested. But again, I got to see the context and it could be, Microsoft playing games with numbers. You also mentioned Vast. I watched, I was sitting at the bar having dinner after Snowflake, uh, waiting for the red eye. There's too many red eyes. And watching your interview with the, the founder or co founder of Vast, Jeff Denworth, and I put out on LinkedIn, I, was, I thought this was a storage company. So there's something cooking yeah. there where they've got some announcement coming beyond storage they were they had they were in the conversation around data platforms which is interesting you know coming at it from you know kind of a data storage view versus you know your snowflake and databricks coming at it from their data warehouse and analytics point of view and then the cloud guys coming at it from the cloud point of view so it'd be interesting to see if vast has some new perspectives you know the, their founder renan is you know he's, he's one of these israeli guys that think about things differently you know, you remember the Iguazio guys, they always had really good thought leadership. Um, so I'm really curious as to what they got cooking there. And then the other thing you mentioned, SuperCloud, we got SuperCloud 3 coming up in uh, July 18th. When we're going through, it's a live event and we drop in a lot of the pre-records. We got Matthew Prince the other day, it was amazing. George Kurtz, I talked to him this morning. Jaya Ballou, who's the chief security officer at Rapid7. Phil Venables is a CSO. Uh, of CISO at uh, Google Cloud. Jay Trodri is going to be in studio live that day. We got Mario Duarte. Doug, coming Doug, Merritt, from, Doug Merritt's from coming Snowflake. out of retirement exclusive. Doug First. Merritt's coming into the studio that day. Uh, and a number of other folks coming in. You just had G2 and Tom Gillis. I had FOMO because I had something else going on. I couldn't participate in that. Um, so, really, you know, the whole focus on cross cloud security and the impact of generative AI. One of the things that's come out of my pre-records is that generative AI, the consensus is, and not a lot of people will, will talk about this, but if you get them talking in, in private, you can get them to sort of admit it, that initially the technology community had the advantage here because they had all the AI tech. Not that the adversaries didn't have access to AI tech, they did, but there, but it wasn't as prevalent as it, as it, as it, as it is post chat GPT. So they had the advantage, the tech vendors, the defenders, yeah. and now it's flipped and the adversaries seem to have the advantage now, whether it's phishing emails or driving automation or just making you know, the attacks more efficient, uh, taking patch Tuesday and more quickly finding out where the holes are. That used to take you know, a lot of work, a lot of thinking, That's, that time is compressed. So patch Tuesday becomes hack Wednesday. It's now like, Patch Tuesday becomes Hack Tuesday because you can compress the, the time at which you can hack. So that's an interesting flip that I hadn't really sort of heard or thought about deeply. So we're going to keep probing on that. And the SuperCloud is just an awesome community event to gather people, and you know, it's our it's sort of an editorial event, and uh, not a lot of pimpage and commercials, which is good. I mean, people always get their commercials in there, but you know, that's not really what it's about. So it's good. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Good. Good rant. I mean, I got to tell you, super cloud is emerging. We had uh, folks are using it as a verb now in terms of identifying that super cloud layer. You know, I just think, uh, you know, the, the the world is coming into a cultural shift. I was just um, reading the Wall Street Journal around some of the the drugs that are coming out. The um, We're in this post CRISPR gene editing thing, weight loss drugs, long um, um, living longer. There's more evidence coming in and the gene editing techniques. Um, and it's very interesting to see some, how these, the drug market is going to change there. So, you know, you got that kind of kind of bio chemical uh, trend. It's tech related, obviously. Um, a lot of that stuff you couldn't, couldn't do before cloud computing. Um, I'm really intrigued by the industrial impact of the edge, uh, industrial edge, Internet of Things, um, as we call it. 
I think this next gen cloud that we wrote about last November uh, at reInvent with our exclusive with the CEO of AWS, Adam Slesky, we we hinted at this next gen super cloud is playing out. And I think looking back at 2023, I think we're going to look at it and saying, Dave, that was a year that we really kind of saw super cloud emerge. I think there's going to be a lot of cultural extinctions happening. When I say extinctions, I mean communities. You look at um, virtual machines, for instance, huge VMworld is an event that's happened over and over again. Now it's called VMware Explore. They're just getting bought by Broadcom. You're going to see that entire generation of IT ops practitioners evolve and get reskilled into cloud operations, which is a natural road that's been, they've been on for over a decade. Okay, so what does that mean? Does that mean they become Microsoft people or AWS people? or Oracle people, there's no people. It's one thing, it's called cloud and, and and cloud and AI. So like, if you think about how IT work has been done, and you're a historian like me, we like to look at the history and then go forward. Think about the, the impact of the technology trends we're on now and how it's gonna impact the work of the personnel involved that we all know, friends, stacking racks, top of rack switches, you know, you know, IT glass house mainframes. Um, now we have a company I interviewed that's essentially got a COBOL, I like got AI bots, code generators, assistants who code COBOL. They've ingested the entire language and it's a COBOL programming. And they're running the table in, in FinOps, FinTech, I mean. You know why? Because no one can hire book COBOL programmers. Well, guess what? AI does that now. So, and then you got AI bridging modern applications, uh, or older applications into the modern era. So, so the role of people, where do they go? And so the companies that could capture that value as a community in this new economic time where collective intelligence, um, things like uh, threads points out to us that you can avoid these cold starts if the crowd's already there. So you got a dynamic going on in tech that we've never seen before in a sense, the maturization of the world in technology is so there. So to me, I think that's so compelling. If I'm an investor, I'm looking at the role of the people and the social media interrelationships that they have. And I think that's why the AI and this data, your, their data is more valuable. And that's why I think our value at SiliconANGLE and theCUBE after 13 years of having data and having a lot of metadata and language data allows us to put into position to be a check against hallucinations, check against quality, check against our community. So companies like us, and I think the media, if you're Vox or you're these other big companies, they're going to be in a good position. And I think if I'm not, if I'm them, if I'm not retooling right now with AI, they're going to be extinct. So, I mean, it's a very fascinating conversation. I'm observing this at VMworld this year. Um, VMUG, all these people, they're all awesome tech dudes and gals. And guess what? You know what they're doing? They're provisioning cloud and AI and edge. <laughs> yeah. so, they don't, so, so they love the super cloud. You know why? Because they want to work on multiple clouds, not just be just Amazon or just Azure. They got to be multi-talented, multi-disciplined across multiple code bases. And with AI coming, that can be done for them. So I think you're going to see a massive acceleration of the endpoints, physical and application AI. And then the middle is going to be all, it's going to develop over the next 24 months so fast. And it's going to be a land grab. Databricks, Snowflake, at scale, vast data, MongoDB, um, you name the company's Cloudflare, just go down the list. It's going to be it's going to be a run. And, and I think you're going to look at the public companies and the privates and go, which one's going to be capturing that? And you're going to be able to tell right away. Do they have vaporware or do they have legit product? Yeah, and you know, thinking about, you mentioned that we're industry historians in a way. You know, we're seeing a step function in the compression of the cycle of the time it takes for change to occur. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. It, it's usually more gradual. I mean, we certainly saw, you know, a little bit of a step function with the internet, you know, in total, it was a huge step function, but, but it, you know, kind of really didn't have a massive, it was more like an S curve, you know, an OGIVE that could have sort of slow slope and then hit. And then the cloud was sort of similar. And I feel like NAI, it, it's like a new OGIVE, the, 
the steep part of the S curve has been like smashed into what would normally be the gestation period. Now, maybe it's because the gestation period started in, you know, the 19. 50s, 60s, or 70s, and it's been taking a long time, but I don't think so. I think it's that we've now got so much data and so much processing power and so much, many people sort of working on this that you've you've seen, you went from whenever, you know, OpenAI announced ChatGPT, what was that, November? It was like this massive step function and awareness, and you see GPT 3.5, now GPT 4, GPT 4 is now available. All these other models are coming out, these LLM models. And everybody, to your point, is taking advantage of it. And the market, okay, you've got Snowflake and Databricks and the cloud guys, we talked about them thriving. You know, you go to Dell Tech World, you go to HPE Discover, these, these companies are kicking ass. There's a vibrant community. The, they're, they're, the shows were packed, both Dell and HPE had 10,000 people there. So really interested crowd, all talking about LLMs. How do I take advantage of this? Oh, it's going to be on-prem. Oh, it's going to be in the cloud. Oh, it's going to be both. Oh, it's going to be at the edge. Just this massive, massive market. The TAM is, it's like when you listen to guys at Snowflake, the Wall Street analysts are pressing them like, how do you quantify this? How big is it? And they're like, look, we, we don't know we actually can't give you a credible answer because we can't take a bunch of IDC data and extrapolate it and put it for, it's like the entire economy. It's like, it's like, John, how big is the internet? <laughs> right? uh, it's the entire GDP of the world. Okay. Well, I did, I, I did a um, little network effect calculation. I, I shared that with you. And, you know, there's 40 billion people that, as if you factor in the LinkedIn, remember the LinkedIn had that first degree separation kind of um, calculation yeah. back when they first came out. Yeah, your first, you know, first degree uh, friends, and then they showed you your network reach. That's very much in play right now, and I think a lot of people have so much connective uh, relationships that the graphs are important right now, and I think that's why I'm fascinated by threads and keep talking about it because it's playing out on its third day. I'm going to be continuing to to be on that on on that on that experiment and do a report on it. But I did the math on some of our relationships that over 13 years. We've interviewed close to 30, 7, 18,000 people on the cube in in 13 years, um, and that like 30,000 videos. You know that has network effect. We're on LinkedIn. Our audience, from a first-party standpoint, is so much smaller relative to the multiplier that it reaches globally. Because everyone always asks me, "What's your reach?" I'm like, "Well, that's an interesting question. We don't really do email marketing, so we're not optimized to capture every name. We're we're optimized to get flow and push it out as far as we can. That's, but that's not a measurement system that's compatible with today's market. But that's network effect. So." People are like, okay, so can you tell me the number? Well, I ran the math. Dave, we reached 30 million people, potentially. <laughs> so, but are, do we have 30 million people in our network? Yes, technically. Do we reach 30 million people? They don't watch TV. They're not watching. They're not going to the Cube site or the Cube Silicon Angle every day. But our content, when published, hits a surface area first party and then has a network effect that progresses. It, it has life. And so you're seeing with these threads, these algorithms that turn the knobs are very important tuning mechanisms for understanding network routes, you know, a people's affinities. So Facebook has absolutely mastered that. Okay. No one else has. This is where I think the AI stuff's going to be massive opportunity. And I think, you know, when people ask questions like, what is your, what is your traffic for Silicon Angle? I roll my eyes. You didn't say you're an idiot. All right. So they don't get it. Well, and, 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 well, are, I asked that question too, but it's not because I'm an idiot. It's because I'm, it's a well, data point, but, well, but, but no, the, it's, but, it's, but, it's but, you can, but, you can ask what was the consumption estimate of something, but not, you can't usually globalize and say, how many uniques do you get per month? That was well, an but, old web traffic metric. Know, Yahoo. It's, still a, it's still a, it's still a metric, but to your point, if that's the only metric that you're looking at, you're missing probably an order of magnitude more consumption. Yeah, I'd which say is really your point. A, a, a site like TechCrunch or Yahoo.com has massive monthly uniques relative to others, but they're not optimized for other things, right? They're not optimized for pushing content. In fact, a lot of them are, have paywalls and they're anti-sharing. 
So open source is coming. I said this before in the podcast, and I want to say it again. But you know that the idea of closed versus open is interesting. Threads is closed, but open for everyone if you have an Instagram account, but closed for anything else. So how do you make money from Threads if you go if you're a user? Yeah, promote yourself, promote your services, right? Just the yeah. same way you would do on Twitter, right? I mean, unlike YouTube, right? YouTube, YouTube they'll is, pay you. Yeah, YouTube is kind of good, you know? TikTok is totally head fake. The creators on TikTok are getting squeezed. Well, I made a comment. Of... I made a comment on Threads the other day. I'm like, is this good for mental health? I'm on the app all the time because I like it. It's addicting, but I'm thinking more on Threads, but TikTok's more brain dead. Let me ask you a question. How much time do you spend now on Clubhouse? Zero. Okay, you were like amazing on Clubhouse. You were participating, you were into yeah. it. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. You spent a lot of time there because you were interested, not only you were interested in the format, the tech, and obviously you're a social person, uh, but I don't spend any time there either. I used to go in, you know, pretty regularly, I used to host stuff. Um, and so, you know, that's the big question is the well, novelty the of this. The conversations, the conversations were good there. And then they, when they, when they had tried to grow, they lost it. So the question for threads is they're already at 70 million. I mean, that's a huge number. 70 million. It's an active, the threads are active. There's no doubt about I mean, it. 70 it's, million is active. There's good content on there. Like you yeah. said, it's finds you content, finds you. Yeah. It's very visual very Instagram like in a way, but, but much more interactive and, and engaging. So it's, yeah, it's Instagram meets Twitter on meta yeah. <laughs> as a, as a walled garden, yeah. but it's good. It's actually very good. I mean, it's, it's got the, inst it's got the Instagram vibe with the, the old Twitter engagement. You remember when we first got on Twitter, you know, I, I used to, I used to write on the old wiki. I would tweet it out and I, we had a counter on the wiki and this is the old wikibond.org, which if you go there, it's still up, but I, <laughs> I'd be careful. But anyway, <laughs> um, I would tweet out at like 2 AM, a blog that I wrote, just wrote or a wiki that I just post. And it would get like, like within seconds, it would have hundreds of views because it was early on Twitter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you got great engagement early on. So to the earlier point, it's you're getting much better engagement on threads than you get on, on Twitter typically with the Instagram vibe. So it's it's good. Let me it's actually it. really good. I mean, the, my traffic on Twitter is plummeting. You know, what do you uh, mean? Your, your, your traffic, every, how are you measuring every, that? Every post, you can see how many tweets, people view your tweets. Yeah. But I mixed for me. I mean, it depends on what it is. Like when I sit there and do those stupid, like hold my phone out and say, hey, we're here live at the Snowflake Summit, you know, ecosystem, blah, blah, blah. It actually gets really good traffic. So so I put, uh, I put a thread, I'm on threads, oh. and I got 232 views. Yeah, well, when I post something that's, I think, you know, nuanced or intelligent or something that nobody else is talking about, but doesn't isn't goofy, it, you know, it's hundreds. Uh, yeah, versus and, tens of thousands sometimes if you yeah if you goofball it i don't know it's hard to say you get the cnbc guy who did a skype thing got six five thousand views he's from cnbc that should be like fifty thousand. and then you go on um linkedin you're getting hundreds of thousands i mean that my post on uh, matt garment over a hundred thousand um views you know a lot of, it tracks you know flies so you know you got to go with the audiences and i think you know twitter's losing audience that's why i asked about the uh the dow you know daily active uniques it's gonna be a very interesting tell sign you know what what uh what that what happens and i, and, and I think it, you know facebook's dangerous company in the sense they're massive scale this is going to prove you know i i think ultimately if i'm i'm, a, if I'm at the doj i'm at the you know, monopoly department there down government, you know, they're worried about Amazon. I think Facebook is flexing their muscles on what they can become. And, you know, I've, and I'll go to the rant section, so we're starting that now, but, you know, Facebook, and I said this on the cube, and I'll go back to prediction. I think it's true because that's what they're doing. When they were under siege for the election stuff, they changed their name to Meta. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. And I said, you asked me, why do you think they did that? I said, not because of metaverse, because they're going to hide for a while. 
They were still printing money with Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp as a monopoly. And they're going to, Zuckerberg's going to hide. He's foil boarding. He's traveling the world, showing everyone his thing. Instagram's going. And at the right time, they're going to turn back on the Facebook. Well, this is basically the Facebook DNA infrastructure, you know, algorithmic user manipulation, user product, user is the product. Um, and I think now's the time where you're starting to see Facebook flex there. We're back. Okay. And someone called it a comeback. I'm like, comeback. They were already rich. It wasn't like they, they had any comeback. They were, they were, you know, sent to the, they were, they got kicked out of town basically after they broke democracy. And so now they're coming back out. I mean, they're not the most well-loved company from a ethics standpoint, as you pointed out, but yeah. Elon Musk isn't either. So the, I think their entry to the market is look at threads. It's essentially Instagram. This is their modern Facebook. Facebook of the old is like the seventies, bell bobs, leisure suits. Now you got punk rock fashion <laughs> with Instagram threads and it's the modern version. And again, everyone who's in, who's at that age group or in their thirties having kids, you know, they're not moving fast, breaking things. They're just having a good time and it's a new party and they're going to cut the politics out and all the news and it's going to be a Twitter takeover. That's the goal of this whole initiative. And that's why they're putting an entire company resource of meta behind threads to get a hundred million uh, to beat chat GPT, get back in the AI game. And it's, it's a comeback in the sense of, okay, don't forget about all the stuff we did years ago with Facebook and give us a mulligan. Well, and, and they do that through control. And nobody's talking about the metaverse, so that's a win. That's for, a fail. For, for, but that's a win for meta, and that nobody's talking about the metaverse because it was a fail. And then, you know, you saw Fitzy's post, I think you saw he put out a new post today, basically snarking on how the EU doesn't have access to threads on top of not having access to BARD. So welcome to the world of you can't get access to it, because we're, you know, over over rotating on regulation. So good luck. <laughs> no. All right. Well, Dave, it's been uh, episode nineteen. You want to have a rant section? I just ranted pretty much the whole time on threads. You have to, you know. I mean, I, again, I'm going to be on it for more more commentary. This is not going to be the first time we're going to be talking about um, mm. threads. I guarantee you, the 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 angles on this thing will be multifold. Yeah, One, I just, monopoly. My, Number two, are they a platform or are they editorial? They got editors. They could be sued. So what's, uh, you know, as you look at the, these platform regulations, good question. We'll bring that up another time, but it's going to yeah. come up a lot. But 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 the, the, the quick rant is nobody trusts Facebook meta. I mean, come on. The governance model, they're not going to save the world from Twitter. Well, even if they have moderators, they're, their intentions are to make money. Okay, good. That's what they're that's what their job is to make money, but don't give me this, we're open and the kumbaya and that's just nonsense. I mean, nobody, nobody, sh nobody should believe that. I don't know, maybe people do, but um, I don't. <laughs> you don't? No, I think uh, I believe Meta like I believe the government. <laughs> I, mean, I just don't, <laughs> I think they're full of yeah. shit and a lot of things. So yeah. I don't, but I don't believe it. They just, you know, they say things, but, Behind the scenes, the hallway talk is a lot different. Now they have to be careful to put it into email. Right? They have to couch it with fancy words and veiled narratives, but we know what Meta wants. Meta wants profit, right? They want yeah. world domination. That's clear. You are the product. All right. Well, All right, John. We, we believe in open, free content. We don't believe in walled guards. We believe in pushing content out there. Uh, we love we love technology, and of course, Dave. We're going to SiliconAngle.com is where all the stories are. TheCube.net. We're on we're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Threads, Reddit. <laughs> I'm not. A, I have Blue Sky, but I don't use it at all. I don't use anything else. I have other other channels are open. WhatsApp, Signal, whole nine yards. Episode 19. See you next time.